Welcome, thank you for coming. My name is Elizabeth Barrick Hall. I am a psychiatrist and a colleague of, of Jean Boland's, and it's my great honor to introduce her today. Um, I've been thinking about, uh, she's probably well known to many of you, but it's probably uh, bears repeating several things, otherwise I could keep you here for an hour and a half all with her accomplishments, but I, I won't try to, to do that. Um, but some of the things that I think are relevant to this presentation today, uh, for sure, are Jean's early history as a Japanese American and coming to terms uh, with the issue of internment of Japanese Americans during that time and how her family dealt with those kinds of things. That's certainly one key experience that led, I believe, and I think you talk about, that's led Jean to this kind of position in this place today. Another really important uh, area for me personally, I'm a physician and a psychiatrist as well, and um, Jean is a, a physician, a scientist, a scholar, and a psychiatrist, in addition to being a union analyst, and that brings an incredible depth of understanding both uh, to the human condition on a global but also on a personal perspective. And one of the things that I personally have appreciated so much about the way that she practices is that from what I know of how Jean works, it all, it all comes down to her relationship with her people in the consulting room. And so that is a very grounded approach, I believe, to any kind of activism and any kind of uh, teaching in the world. And then, of course, the third area that's very, very important is uh, Jean as author. And I'm sure many of you have read her books. And if you haven't, I certainly invite you to um, open up a very exciting world. And her recent book is Artemis, the Indomitable Spirit in Every Woman. And uh, that is, of course, part of the basis of today's, uh, today's <coughs> talk. And again, uh, these books, as you know, there are uh, at least 13, uh, over 85 languages. Uh, Goddesses in Every Woman is now published for the 30th anniversary edition, so it's really exciting how any of you who know anything about publishing will realize how amazing that is to have a book that's, that's managed to stay in circulation. And, and then Goddesses in Every Man is the, has had the 25th anniversary edition recently as well. So these are uh, very, very profound uh, books and have contributed so much to the culture. And as we, yesterday uh, I was in the opening session where Patricia LeCuinen was speaking the keynote address, and I'm not sure if any of you heard of it. It was heard it. It was a beautiful presentation. She was um, speaking from the heart about her experiences, things she had learned in Beijing. But she ended her session with a, what I just uh, thought was a wonderful piece that she talked about how we're tired, how as feminists and as women working in this movement and men, that people are getting a little tired and it's really important to remember to take care of yourself. It's really important to remember to stay grounded. And uh, from my experience, uh, Jean's work is exactly that. It gives us that opportunity to be fed, to be spiritually supported, psychologically supported, as we do very good and important works in the world. And I think this is one of the truly unique aspects that she offers us, is this ability to both be deep and conscious, as well as be an activist and loud and sometimes to piss people off. <laughs> so I welcome Jean Bolin today and I look forward to hearing Thank you, you. Today. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth introduces me and I have no idea what she's going to say. <laughs> so one of the things is I didn't expect her to bring up my Japanese American background <laughs> or the uh, experience during World War II. But I think it is actually very relevant, not just to me, but to all of the people in this room, because I would imagine that you had something of the experience of what I would call positive liminality, or positive, it's when you are on the edge and you don't fit in and you have to be a little bit wary because the world is not that friendly towards you, maybe. And if you have a Japanese face or any kind of face or orientation that is not the majority, you get a little bit unaware that maybe you're not safe. And yet, if you made it to this conference, you're successful at some level in the world. It means that you also have a great deal of respectability wherever you are. And so, but you can't go unconscious because you don't quite fit in either place.
place. So positive liminality, positive marginality when you're on the edge, but you are not, you're an outlier rather than an outcast, is a wonderful place to be in terms of consciousness because you don't go unconscious. You are aware of both from, from two directions. And I used to, when I wrote Goddesses in Every Woman, I called it binocular vision that you can see in depth when you look at something from two angles. And every woman, by the way, has a kind of binocular vision because you fit into your family or society, but you are a woman and that puts you on in the middle often of organization, not in the middle of an organization, but on the edge. And you can't, and you look at it from two angles. And binocular vision is what we all have. You look at an object with the eyes that look at it from two angles, and that equals depth. So I began writing as a union analyst, as a psychiatrist. I began becoming a psychiatrist in the 60s, in the late 60s, when the women's movement was beginning. And it, I became very aware of what culture does, but also I began to learn about the archetypes within us. So there are two things that work on us. It's what we come into the world with what Carl Jung called the archetypes. And the archetype within us, when we are able to live them out because our family and culture actually allows those qualities to be lived out, it gives us meaning. It can get us into trouble because every archetype has a shadow or a difficult side as well. But that's the archetypal level. And then there's the stereotypical level, or the level in which projections and expectations are put on us, and we're supposed to sh be shaped by them. In ancient Greek mythology, there was a story of Procrustes. If you were on the road to Athens, you had to pass Procrustes and his bed. And Procrustes took you and put you on his famous bed. And whatever part of you did not fit, whack, he cut it off. And if you were too short for the bed, you were stretched as if on a medieval rack to fit the bed. And then you were set on the road to Athens. Well, <coughs> Athens, the metaphor for success, is when every little girl or boy is put on according to family values, where you were supposed to be acceptable, who you were supposed to be accepted by, and what part of you was not acceptable, you, were, you learned to cut it out, cut it off, quiet it, and when you could do that, you were on your way to Athens. Well, one of the interesting things about the psyche is that it truly is metaphor that whatever is cut off is not cut off and is dead, but it's in your personal unconscious or those parts that are archetypally who you are that were not allowed the light of day is still down there. And so at some other phase of your life, at some other historical time in recent history, Feminism comes along and awakens things that might not have been able to live at another time and age. So I began uh, being affected by the women's movement and uh, was a very active member in the American Psychiatric Association where I headed the Council on National Affairs. When my organization decided by referendum, and this was an organization at that time that was hugely preponderance male. 89% of the psychiatrists in the, um, in the United States belonged to the American Psychiatric Association, which was just about, if you were a respectable psychiatrist, you belonged to it. 89% men, 11% women. And the <clears throat> policy it had been to support the Equal Rights Amendment. And then there was a referendum that said we didn't want to do that, if we had to do anything to implement it. That's what often the issue is. The, the words sound good. We support equal rights for women. But if it involves going to a withdrawing from a non-ratified state, uh-uh. If we have to pay the price for what we say we believe in, forget it. And so the referendum was passed. And it was like the American Psychiatric Association who had two-thirds of its patients women, you know, and being treated unequally is bad for your mental health. 
<laughs> and really, this organization should have supported the Equal Rights Amendment, and they did on paper, then they withdrew it, and then they went to San Francisco for the next conference. And since I was the only national uh, active person in San Francisco, as the woman in San Francisco, I felt like it was up to me. And I don't know how many of you have been in that spot, where you realize that you are going to have to take it on or not, but it's a choice. And when you do, it's what I've ended up calling it is your assignment. It goes along with the notion of such people as Joseph Campbell, who says that you must find your personal myth and live it. Or Carl Jung that talks about individuation, the whole thing that you have a purpose, you have a life, you came in and you ran into the particular family, the particular degree of suffering, whatever it was, the gifts that you had, and it all, they all can't contribute to living the life from with inside out as to who you were meant to be. I remember when the book by Marlo Thomas came out, it influenced a whole generation of children. Maybe some of you were children at that point who got it, free to be you and me. Mm -hmm. And there was a song, somewhere there's a land where every boy grows up to be the man he was meant to be and every little girl grows up to be the woman she was meant to be. And of course, that is not the way it is. So here it is, for me, a moment of truth. When, you, when I call, you can step up or not, and you have to decide. And if it's yours to do, you can say no or yes. It's a voluntary kind of commitment, a, a level of, of uh, stepping up to pick up your assignment. I say that an assignment comes along with your name on it. You recognize that you could step up to the plate or step up to the task or say yes. And if you do, you know it has personal meaning to you. All kinds of causes have personal meanings. But the ones that you have taken on, and every person in this room must have taken on something. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been here. And it probably had personal meaning to you. Maybe because of your childhood, maybe because of your ethnicity. Definitely because of the experiences that you had in life that it had meaning to you to take it on. And secondly, I think a true assignment will also be fun. That it is fun to become who you were meant to be, use your talents to develop things, and also to do it with others who share your values and work together towards the same ends. It can be very hard work, and if you don't do what Elizabeth mentioned about taking care of yourself, you can get burned out. But the issue is, it needs to be fun, which means that you have to learn how to do heart-connected activism. You need to be able to, to, to have a sense of inner and outer reward. And the outer reward may be that you are doing it with people who know what you're doing, and you're doing it together. And the last thing is I truly believe that you the third, the third criteria is that it is actually motivated by love, not by wish of power, not by vengeance, not by getting even, but truly by love. And it could be love of what it is you want to save, whether it's, a, whether it's an animal, a tree, a girl, women, rights, whatever it is, human rights. There's something that calls to you to do what you do. Now this does have to do with Artemis, the archetype, the goddess. And let me weave it in as to why it is so. That Artemis was a goddess of the hunt and goddess of the moon. And she was liberated by the women's movement. So for example, uh, in Goddesses and Every Woman, and when I talk about Artemis, certainly Gloria Steinem as a feminist big sister uh, who came to the aid of women. Well, this is the realm of, the, of this particular goddess. And one step leads to another often when you take on something because it's yours, and you do it because it has meaning for you and because it matters, and you step up to it and you do it. And so I wrote a letter to Gloria Steinem back in the days of the Equal Rights Amendment when, when I was sort of taking on the, the American Psychiatric Association, and she came aboard. 
and she uh, t took on the position of, of saying that she would, she had a press conference in San Francisco and said that um, Ms. Magazine would publish the names of psychiatrists who went to the non-ratified state, which was, was uh, Louisiana. And suddenly, because of the archetype of Artemis, really, I mean, when you get a, when men in power distort reality and become afraid of a woman, it's be really because they are responding to the archetype in her. So suddenly there were comments about fears to go because Gloria Steinem could prevent them from getting a grant from the National Institutes of Mental Health. I mean, it was really absurd. <laughs> Lots of things were, but all of a sudden she was blown up as having much more power than she really had. But projected on her was the power of Artemis, the power to punish, uh, the power to uh, stand up to them. Well, the story of, of Artemis, the goddess, begins when she was born as the first of twins. And as soon as she was born, she experienced watching her mother, Leto, going into the worst labor in mythological history. <laughs> and that Hera, the jealous wife of the philandering Zeus, who had impregnated Leto, had said that nobody, nobody give aid to Leto when she went into delivery and at, or she would punish them. And so she put a hex on Leto that did not follow obstetrical history. I mean, usually if you have twins, the first one might be a little harder, but the second one comes out rather easily usually. But in this case, not so. Artemis watched her mother have this awful prolonged labor and helped her mother with the delivery of her brother Apollo. The gods and goddesses are not like ordinary folks, obviously. And the midwives to this day use the herb Artemisia, named after Artemis, who, by the way, her Latin name is, is Diana. And so she has a connection with women who want to uh, midwife women in, who are pregnant and help them to have as a painless delivery. Well, when, later, when, when Artemis was three years old, she was introduced to her father for the first time. And the poet Callimachus talks about how when Zeus met his little daughter Artemis, he was very pleased with her. He, was, he, he, said, he said that with a daughter like you, I don't mind Hera's wrath. And then she, he said to her, whatever you would like, I'll give it to you. And she knew exactly what she wanted, because this is also true. Artemis knows the archetype has a sense of what she wants. At three years old, many of you were just like her. You had a sense of yourself, so if someone asked you, it wasn't, oh, I don't know, you decide. Rather, it was, I want a bow and arrow to hunt with. I want hunting dogs. I want nymphs to play with. And I don't want to wear, and I want to wear a tunic and not a goddess gown. And I want to choose them myself. <laughs> this is that mind of your own kind of thing that you may have remember being told you had when you were a little girl. Because this is a little girl who at three or four or seven says, it's not fair. There's a real sense of selfhood at some level. And often it does get squelched. But if it remains archetypally within that woman, it's that part that remains one unto herself anyway. The idea of, of indomitable, which I've used in the title of the book Artemis, means untamed, unsubdued. It means that even if you are raped, you do not identify with victim. It's the woman that we hear in, in conferences here, workshops here, women who went through some awful initiation as a girl and is here as an activist, 
Well, this is that kind of energy because some part of her remains who she is inside. And the image is often uh, of the metaphor of a virgin in the sense not of that no one has ever had sex with you. You haven't been raped. You haven't had intercourse. You haven't been married. There's still, or you have all of those things may have happened, but a part of you remains virgin, one unto herself. And that means sort of like having a virgin forest that doesn't have uh, roads running through it, that hasn't been logged, that is the pristine forest that, that was meant to be. That element, that if you stay in touch with that, is very much part of this Artemis archetype, the one unto yourself archetype. Well, when you think about what she asked for, the bow and arrow, and I'm saying that Artemis was the archetype that was liberated in the United States by the women's movement. And all over the world, there are still places that she needs to be liberated, because she is the girl who, who, who has an innate sense of social justice. She has an innate sense also as being, having equality with boys and men. She was one of twins. She uh, had this sense, and, and women who are feminists so often have easily brotherly relationships with men. They don't do an automatic, patriarchal, hierarchal, I'm the little woman, you're the big man kind of thing. It's not who they are. So <clears throat> Artemis starts out with, the, with a sense of, of equality with men. And you know, I said that she chose, she wanted nymphs to be with, and she was a goddess who had a natural sense of sisterhood. And you, you know that not all women have a sense of sisterhood. But if you are a feminist, you do. I saw that in psychiatry. <clears throat> Among us, there were the, the women who identified with all women. We might be the psychiatrists and our patients are patients, but it took very, it, we didn't see ourselves as, as somehow being greatly different from them. So we would, we had the imagination, which I think most of you have, of sensing, a sen by sensing sisterhood, it, it means a sense of relatedness. It means a sense that you don't feel superior. You realize that, you really realize that whatever happens to another woman could have happened to you, but for your good fortune, maybe it didn't. Or if it did, if you maintain that sense of Artemis, you are going to now do something because it gave you meaning to suffer what you suffered and then take it and make a difference out of that experience. So Artemis has a sense of natural egalitarian with, with men. She has a sense of sisterhood. She can aim for a target and hit it. The natural ability to have this archetype of being able to focus on a distant target. Fifth Women's World Conference 2020, for example, is a distant target. And it may seem like a target in the face of, of uh, the institutional kind of disinterest in it not going to happen unless the groundswell for such a thing rises up and and it's amazing how things can happen actually so far in 2012 the president uh, of the general assembly in ban ki moon spoke in favor of having it and all they needed was a resolution from the general assembly and it didn't come through it was proposed it didn't come through and so then it is on the table as an idea. It wasn't voted on and defeated. It just was not picked up and re requested by the two most, the strong, the, the top of the hierarchy men requested it. And it didn't come. And so it stays on that table to be picked up when the time is right. And by now, as you're hearing about Beijing plus 20, a lot of you were too young to have gone to it. And there's something about what we know about women 
and the capacity to grow over time and learn from each other and do things in circle uh, so that watching us change the world through consciousness raising groups in the 1960s to 70, 1963 to 1970. The movement began and by 1970 it was a decade of the women's movement. And this is the whole, whole part of the sense of history, recent history, that says, yes, we can go from small circles with a spiritual center and move it into a movement, reach a point of critical mass tipping point, and so change the women in the circles and affect the world. Well, I'm weaving the archetype of the sister, who is Artemis, into this because it is through women's groups working together that the ideas and potentialities of the women in it are encouraged to grow. That often in a culture and a family that do not expect women to do whatever they're capable of doing in groups with other women, they have role models, they have a sense of sisterhood, a sense that if she could do it, I could too. And that that really does matter. Well, um, Artemis, with her bow and arrow, has that as a, a ability. The other is her capacity as goddess of the moon. That if you have a sense of the symbology of the moon, you see things by reflected light, is one meaning of it. Meaning that you actually reflect on matters. That there's an introverted side that reflects, that sees things by reflected light, by taking it in. And the other is the mystical side of Artemis. That Artemis, of all the archetypes in women, was the one who went away to Girl Scout camp uh, and was sent there by parents and then wanted to go back a second time. And so if you were an archetypal Girl Scout, nature, camping out, showing you could do a lot of physical things, uh, being um, a competitor was actually a natural part of childhood that you took to. And only since the women's movement was that encouraged. Uh, before then, it never was encouraged to be, for example, women did not, girls did not do team sports. <laughs> now from about age seven on, there is soccer, girl soccer teams, never was before. But well, think about how you change if you see yourself as part of a team of girls and you like it and you can be yourself and you score. These are things that is what I meant when I said that the women's movement, Title IX in particular, liberated aspects uh, of the Artemis archetype. There's a story about Atalanta who, who is, was a mortal woman who exemplifies some of the Artemis qualities, and that Atalanta was, when Atalanta was born <coughs> in Arcadia, uh, her father, the king, had expected a son and heir. And when that newborn baby turned out to be a girl, he was so outraged and angry that he said to a servant, take her up to the mountain and just leave her there. And so she began her life rejected, put up on this mountaintop where she didn't die or the story would be over. But what happened is that it was said that she was under the protection of Artemis so that a mother bear came along and probably sniffed the baby. Maybe the baby did the grass thing and grasped the, the fur. And what happened is they bonded and the bear uh, suckled the little baby and the little baby grew, raised by Mother Bear, until she was a toddler and was found by hunters who, who actually took pleasure in this little girl who was so competent at things. They taught her how to hunt and language, and that was her beginnings. And then she had, actually, in, in uh, Greek mythology, two major stories. One of them had to do with her capacity to stand the charge of the Caledon boar and aim 
with her, again, bow and arrow, the capacity to hit the target of your own she's choosing. And the other thing that she was noted for was being the fastest runner. And interestingly, that is also a sport that girls and women do now. You know, they didn't, weren't runners, they weren't allowed to run. It was considered that it, that the, the Boston Marathon, is, it's, it's only been in a couple of decades since women ran in it. Uh, and they ran in it, and the New York Marathon as well. The New, no, the New York Marathon, they had, uh, when, when the feminism was, was pushing the, the limits to have women run, uh, they said, okay, you can run, but you can't run with the men. You will have to run, start either early, you can start early. So there were five women who were considered eligible to run. And when it came time for them to run, they all sat down and they put a banner up and it ran on the front page of the New York Times said that they, women, demand the right to, to run. I mean, there, this was a time when, when women said, I can do this, let me do this, over and over again. And that changed the world for women in the United States and then modeled it for the rest of the world where it's still not happening. And all you have to do is go to like workshops that we just came from, the one that was talking about investing in girls and, and hearing about how girls are treated in certain places, how the privileges that we have. Whatever it is, you know, to whom much has been given, much is expected. I often think that, that it's so true that to find meaning and purpose, uh, to get yourself to do some good in this world because you truly do have a sense of what it might be to be this other person. I think sometimes that as I watch the politics of men in power, I truly feel that often it is a failure of empathy and a failure of imagination, that it's impossible to, um, for them to imagine, certain men in power, to imagine what it might be like to be another color, another gender, uh, another age. And so what do they need in the, in the terms of support? The idea somehow of being able to, as soon as you're able to imagine and empathize, then, then the potential of feeling like connected and wanting to help is actually part of the goodness that is capable in humans. And so I think when I read in neurosciences that, that, certain, that the alpha males as a group have, you know, this is all left brain, and that the left brain and the right brain become asymmetrical, because if you don't use it, it you lose it, neurons. So if you don't use the right brain, which which is concerned with imagination, with music, with art, with nonverbal kinds of things, with empathic feelings. If you don't use it over time, it does shrink compared to if you overuse the left brain, logic, rationale, uh, either or. And women as a gender have many, many more fibers between right and left brain. And women as a gender have symmetrical brains. And the, the, the connections to the, what's called the corpus callosum have to do with multitasking, empathic connections, and the fact that we are educated these days. And so our left brain is naturally <coughs> educated. While we don't, uh, we, we, we really care a lot about IQ, but we don't care very much about emotional quotient or EQ. And that's a real loss. Uh, the um, sense of Artemis as an archetype in, in uh, uh, to talk a little about Atalanta, who was an a Artemis mortal. Um, there are two stories about her. Besides, the, the, the myth of the Caledon boar presents two of this, the shadow sides of, of this archetype. One is that there, it's a story of, it's a, it's a, it's pretty com it, there are more complexities than I'm going to, to touch on, but I'm going to bring up a couple of things. One is that it was a story of, of, about a partnership 
with Millie Agar, who had been raised a prince in a neighboring country and who had, was a natural hunter. And he went out and hunted, and every so often the effort was made to match him up with a suitable young woman who would be queen, but she, he had nothing in common with him, and he preferred to be out in nature. And at some point, he and she come together. Uh, he goes out hunting, and he sees a, a bear, and he aims for the bear, and he wounds it but he doesn't kill it. And being a good hunter, he follows it as it's bleeding and it's crossing the country and going back towards where it began, began life. And as he follows it hour after hour and the drops of blood, and he comes finally to a, to a, a mountain where the bear dies, and he then, at that point, he sees this woman of his dreams which is Atlanta, because she's this outdoor woman, huntress. She's, we can imagine, uh, long-haired, long-limbed, tanned, <laughs> and, and is his counterpart, actually. And a lot of beginning relationships with Artemis women are with men who are like them in so many ways. This is, this is the pair that looks like twins in so many ways, because they do things that is increasingly becoming a kind of model of lots of couples, of sort of a twinship, the male counterpart. So the two of them come together. She is coming down the mountain. He is smitten. And he says to her, smitten as he is with his anima projection or his dream projection, that, that uh, he introduces himself and he says, I'll give you this pelt as a prize. It's, and she says to him, that pelt was my brother. And now that he wants to love her, she wants to kill him. <laughs> so they, they essentially wrestle as he is, she's trying to kill him and he's trying to hold her and keep him from hurting her from hurting him. And they wrestle and in the story, somehow as they res wrestle out of doors and, and uh, there's the grasses and the perfumes of what of of, the, of nature. Something shifts, and they become a couple, um, because this is the first time that Atalanta has felt skin to skin with another human being. Before she had wrestled with bears, and she's pretty good at wrestling. <laughs> at any rate, they two became a noteworthy couple, and throughout the countryside, they were seen as a couple. And one day that it came. And again, this is, a, this is a shadow side of Artemis that had to do with the country that, that he was a prince of, Caledon, was forested, as old Europe was. Forest, forest everywhere. And Artemis is the goddess of the wilderness. And this is important. Because being a wilderness, if, you're, you're, if your area that you want to go into is a wilderness, it could actually be the world of trees and wilderness. You could be an animal activist. You could be an environmentalist. You could be saving forests. You could be Julia, Julia Butterfly Hill climbing, living in, a, in, a, in an old growth redwood for almost two years. So th there is that that is part of who this archetype is. Uh, she was the goddess who, who was a protectress of prepubescent girls who were referred to as the Arctoi or Artemis's little bears. She looked after the little girl or the young prepubescent adolescent who for a year under Artemis's protection was free from having to live out all of the expectations of a domesticated woman she could live out in the wilderness. So the wilderness is a metaphor. It's whatever, whatever you're curious about that it doesn't have roads through it, new, new, new places, new, new um, experiences. The part of the young woman who wants to go explore, uh, maybe go to the Peace Corps, maybe go uh, work in some country outside of this one that is a wilderness for her. 
uh, the, the, there's something about the and, and for me, it's like exploring the unconscious. The unconscious is a wilderness. If I can make my way through the wilderness and learn more about it through the dreams and the work I do as a Jungian analyst, it fascinates me because I don't know what I'm coming to. I'm, I don't know what I'm going to meet up with next in this wilderness, so to speak. So she, Artemis, was a goddess of the trees, of the forest. And here's this country that is trees all over. And the king of the country offers sacrifices, honors all kinds of gods, and ignores her. <coughs> and she, in her sense of having her desecrated, in a sense, that whole sense of her sacred world, her mattering, um, that she, in her outrage, which happens to be one of the shadow parts of Artemis, is that in her righteousness, she can get, get caught up in the anger. And she did. And she created the Caledon boar, which has ravaged the countryside. And it was, it was a huge kind of uh, animal that trampled everything. And this is when you're so caught up in your rage at what is being done that you forget that there are people's projects that you are trampling on and people's feelings you're trampling on. And this is a shadow of Artemis. And it's only if you can confront it and kill it off, which she does. Uh, Atalanta aims, the, there's this great hunt of the Caledon boar. All the heroes from all over Greece come to become famous. Plus the pelt is such a prize, because if you put on the pelt, it would be like armor. And men after men are named. They're, the, they're the, 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 the men who also are named who went off to fight the Trojan Wars or the, or the fathers of famous Trojan War heroes. So they're all named in Greek mythology. And none of them succeed until uh, Atalanta holds her ground as it charges at her and, and throw, does her bow and arrow and aims her the eye and it staggers and is wounded. And then with her partner, Meli Agar, who uses the sword, the animal is killed. Now, this is how a dream or a metaphor makes sense at some level. That if you have something that is like rage, it does depend on you to perceive it as, as something destructive to who you are and to stand and let it drop and then you take over some of its attributes of thicker skin, because that would be what the pelt is. At another time in the story of Atalanta, what happens is that she was noted as a runner. And I, I, I need to kind of weave pieces together here. This is a story in which there's this intriguing piece and that intriguing piece. And one of the things that, that I'm interested in is hoping to, to pick up on some part of this piece that speaks to you. So that if it is, if it is hitting your shadow and, and your anger and stopping it in its tracks and developing a thinner, thicker skin, so then know that that happens to be what you need to do. And then in another myth of, uh, in which Atalanta is being a runner, it's a story of, of three apples that are dropped in her path, and with each apple comes a new, a new consciousness. So I need to condense it, that what she's doing is that she's good at running. She becomes able to, to run as, um, uh, again, she is in this position where she has finally return back to the kingdom where she was rejected at birth. And she is recognized actually as the heir to the kingdom. The king apparently did not have that son and heir that he so wanted. And meanwhile, Atlanta has become so famous and is recognized by him as his, his heir. And now everybody wants to marry her because she's a, she's a trophy wife. She's got a kingdom, she's beautiful, She's famous, mm -hmm. and, and you will find a variation of this story, by the way, in Marlo Thomas's Free to Be. She is a, she is a feminist story. And what, what she does 
uh, when the king now requires that he, she marry somebody for the kingdom's sake, she says, okay, I will marry someone, but he has to beat me. He has to compete with me in a foot race, and he will lose his life if I win, and I will marry him if he beats me. And man after man who assumed that they could beat her, race her, and lose their lives. Until finally there's just one left, and his name is Hippomenes, and Hippomenes actually loves her and decides that he will race her rather than just give up on ever having her. But before the race, he prays to Aphrodite. And then, as of a dream, Aphrodite appears to him and gives him some advice and three golden apples. And what happens is that he, go, he wakes up in the morning thinking he's had this interesting dream, except that there are three golden apples there. Really. Now, every, every man who had raced and lost to her had raced and prayed the night before as well, prayed to Zeus or Ares or Hermes for the power to overcome her, to subdue her, to win her. Now, this man prayed to Aphrodite that she might love him and he might win this race. So he and she race, and she is really good at this. But she's also tired of it. She's tired of racing. And this is one thing that's very true about an Artemis, is that you can become very good at something, and when you say whatever you do and you do it really well, at the beginning, it's great. It's wonderful to compete and to do it. And then, because getting fame or having power is not one of the major reasons that give an Artemis woman meaning, it gets to be a little bit old. It's so, okay, so I win another prize. Okay, so I, I do this other accomplishment. But, so, but it's a little bit old. It gets a little bit like, I don't think I want to keep doing the same old, same old. Some people are smiling because they probably know that of really themselves. Well, yeah. You know, same old, same old. <laughs> well, she was at that place when, when along comes Hippomenes, and he's not this great racer, and she knows that he, she's going to beat him. And she goes into sort of a thoughtful phrase in, in the actual story and, and looks back at her previous uh, experiences and goes into a reverie. The, the race begins, he takes off, and she's still left at the starting gate, so to speak. But she's very good at it, so as soon as she realizes that the race has begun, she catches up with him very easily, except that he throws a golden apple in her path. And it rolls in front of her, and it's beautiful, and she's attracted to it. So she stops to pick it up and she looks at it. And then he goes further ahead again because he really is racing and she is getting distracted right and left. So he's pulling way ahead again and again. She, she pours it on and she reaches almost to him and this time he throws a second apple off to the side. She watches it roll, she's attracted to it. She picks it up and he's still getting ahead. And now they're almost to the, to the, to the final line and he drops it right at the line. And she could either pick it up and lose the race or ignore it and win the race. And she picks it up, which means that she is now going to be with Hippomenes. And the question is, it would, did seem like she would made the decision where she would get the apple and lose the race. Now, metaphorically, what we then start to look at is what might the apples mean? If you were a young Artemis and you had all this energy and activism before, what about these apples? Well, the first apple, she looks at the apple and she sees herself, her face reflected in it, and it's distorted by the curves of the apple. And for the first time, she thinks, I, I can grow old. This is what I would look like if I would grow old. Now, Artemis women don't seem to think about such things as fast as often other women. They're caught up in whatever they're doing. So noticing the first wrinkle is not something you necessarily notice and get all upset about. 
But now, first, the first insight is that I will grow old. This, I will not stay perpetually young. That's an important insight, actually. And the second apple, what might it be? And as it rolled off, it reminded her of a previous experience, which, which comes back to, would it have been better to have not loved at all? Because so much, if you're an Artemis and you've been hurt or betrayed in a love experience early in life, your ability to focus on what it is that you are interested in focusing in that has meaning for you and all of that, it becomes quite possible to then put it behind you and move on. Artemis, is, Artemis can do that. Put, the, put it behind, move on. And now she's reflecting again with the second apple. For all the pain that that relationship cost, would it have been better to have not loved at all? And what happens with most people is they only remember the bad part at the end. But what about all the other experiences that drew you into it? Might it be a good time to remember <coughs> that and remember the part of you that was involved in that? And so the question is, would it have been better to have not loved at all? And then the third apple. The third apple is it rolls and she picks it, and, or she reaches to pick it up. This is the apple, depending on if you still can, for some women, who have been very active in their 20s and 30s, it's the apple of procreation. It's the conscious awareness that there is a maternal urge, an urge to have a baby that stirs, that will slow you down from the race that you have been in. It is an Aphrodite element that draws you towards having a child, if that is what the question is. But after that period is over, after you have been in life, doing a lot of different things, and you are in that same place of same old, you can continue doing what you're doing. Do it well, run your NGO, do whatever it is you're doing, and the urge becomes creation. The urge is to then make something out of who you are. It might be to go back to when you used to write poetry or to paint. It might have to do with just a whole lot of things, the parts of you that, that could draw from you. It's for a lot of women, it's, it's writing, for example, in which you now have enough experience to want to write something. And the third apple then of Aphrodite, and Aphrodite was the goddess of love and beauty and creativity. So procreation or, or creativity are the, are the apples that, that change consciousness with these, with this, with this goddess. So when you think about, this is sort of Atalanta, this is the heroine, the mortal that was under her protection, but the goddess herself was what covered a lot of different things. She was the only goddess that responded to her mother's plight. That not only was she present and helping midwife her mother, but on another occasion when her mother was about to be raped, another occasion when she was being demeaned verbally, it was Artemis that came to her rescue. She is the goddess who uh, women who were about to be raped prayed, for, prayed to. She was the, the goddess that women who were in labor and wanted a swift delivery prayed to. So just about every kind of feminist cause was reflected by this goddess. And add the environmentalists, add the animal activists. I mean, really, you get the range of activism. So this is an introduction, really, to the goddess Artemis as an archetype, which I really think is maybe an introduction to parts of yourself. I would imagine it's so. I am walking in my garden and I'm carrying three cocoons, one gold, one silver, one white like the moon, and I plant these cocoons safe and 
inside the earth and I pray to the butterflies start to bless their birth.